welcome everyone to this uh, Iran profile. I'm Ricardo Rossi and I'm here with Federico. Hi, Hi. Federico. Hi. And today our uh, guest is Francesco Bartolucci. Hi, Francesco. Hello. Hello. Uh, Francesco is professor of statistics at University of Perugia in the departments of economics. Uh, he's the co-author of a number of statistics packages such as LMS, MultiCRT, and many others. And of course, is a keynote speaker for machine learning at our ERAM 2020 virtual conference in June. So it's our pleasure to have Francesco at this ERAM profile. And let's get started. Welcome on board. Welcome on board. Yes, exactly. Welcome on board. Um, Francesco, um, how, let's say, how and when did you get started with R? So what's your relationship with it? Do you have an exclusive use or, I mean, in your field, in your domain, which is statistics and economics, or are you agno agnostic in, in tool usages for statistics in, in your job? What's your experience? Uh, so uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, one of my main uh, research fields is uh, computational statistics. Good. And uh, I started to work uh, on uh, statistical algorithms uh, uh, during my PhD period, uh, which is uh, uh, already more than 20 years ago. And uh, honestly, the first language in which I implemented such algorithms is MATLAB. And uh, after having had some previous experience in other languages, I then moved to R rather recently, say around, uh, I don't know, five, six years ago. Uh, and I was uh, very motivated of uh, switching from MATLAB to R uh, due to the diffusion of R among statisticians. So nowadays, uh, uh, the diffusion is very, very high in, uh, of R among statisticians. And I love uh, this uh, uh, a lot, okay? Uh, for me, uh, moving from MATLAB to R has been rather easy uh, due to the similarities among the two languages uh, and for the, in particular, I love the flexibility in using matrices and uh, arrays that I strongly, strongly use uh, in my research work. Uh, apart from uh, the great diffusion among statisticians, uh, what I really love of R is the possibility of implementing packages uh, and that of uh, integrating uh, uh, other languages uh, such as uh, C and Fortran uh, to speed up computation. Uh, obviously, I'm not saying that these characteristics are unique of R, but uh, I don't know, I have a particular feeling with R from this uh, and uh, other points of view. So I, I really love uh, this language uh, in particular for my recent research work. How is the MATLAB community holding on in these days? Uh, I don't know because I honestly, I completely <laughs> moved to R. <laughs> okay. So I, now I uh, suddenly, I rarely, I, I work in MATLAB really. Maybe okay. I, I use uh, MATLAB if I have some code for uh, some colleague, but uh, now I, I work 90% uh, in R, okay. And uh, sometimes I use uh, really rarely uh, MATLAB or Stata, but uh, I have to say 90, 90, 99% of what I do is in R. I used to tell people that I also do even more than that, so clo even close to sending emails with R, and yeah. that actually <laughs> no, is not possible. Yeah. But uh, uh, obviously, I, for instance, I use R for teaching a lot. Uh, and uh, everything uh, I teach uh, then uh, is illustrated by some R applications. Uh, and even I now, uh, especially in advanced courses, I ask students to do homeworks and all homeworks are done in R Markdown uh, or in R in general. Yes. So basically you're telling us that you use R also as a teaching tool, which is really yeah. interesting. And yeah. how, how how this is received by students at different levels? Uh, okay, so uh, currently I teach a basic course of uh, uh, statistics for undergraduate students, uh, and then uh, two, uh, 
two courses for uh, uh, graduate students, uh, which are obviously more advanced. So, um, in, even within the basic course of statistics, uh, uh, we use uh, like a short module uh, of R. And I think that uh, the, the students like. Uh, obviously, uh, so young students uh, maybe are more used to use, I don't know, uh, uh, Excel uh, no? or very different uh, approaches to computation. But uh, I think after some uh, uh, seminars or lectures about R, they, they love really. And uh, then uh, um, as a part of our evaluation, even for uh, the basic course, we use uh, uh, we ask them to do a homework, uh, very, very small, very simple anyway, but uh, many, many students uh, participate to, to this activity. Uh, regarding the advanced courses, uh, I teach one course of Bayesian statistics uh, for graduate, stu for master students, uh, and uh, a course of longitudinal data for uh, PhD students. And in both courses, uh, I strongly, really strongly use uh, R to illustrate uh, every, er, almost everything I, I teach theoretically. And uh, as a evaluation tool, I require uh, to do homeworks uh, in this case. So my evaluation is uh, uh, almost all based on homeworks uh, uh, prepared in, in Markdown. And uh, they very really love, uh, I have to be honest. Uh, sometimes they ask me, especially the PhD students, uh, they are in uh, economics. So uh, sometimes uh, one of them asks to, to use uh, Stata, but I have to say that uh, after some time, uh, he or she realizes that uh, maybe R is more flexible in the end. Uh, and so uh, sometimes they switch from, uh, from Stata to, to R. And so I, my impression is very, is very positive. And uh, even uh, the, possibility of using so many packages uh, is uh, very welcome. And uh, another aspect that is uh, very well appreciated is that uh, typically even, uh, especially for the main packages, uh, you can easily find uh, a very detailed paper illustrating uh, its use in a journal statistical software or R journal. And uh, this is very important uh, because one, uh, starts to, to read the paper, at the same time uh, he or she uses uh, R you know, with examples. Uh, and uh, I think it is a very well combination, for instance, that uh, of uh, R with a CRAN, where you can, uh, from where you can download easily packages, uh, and also the, the, two, the two journals, uh, uh, JSS and uh, R journal, that publishes uh, publish many many papers illustrating packages and also a strong advocate actually for vignette like documents i mean uh, there, there is a lot I, I like a lot that there is a, a very nice effort for example with package down and many other say um instruments developed so from the r community to enhance the documentation in a way that people are just not landing to a cran page for your package but they can have say, even books that accompany your, I don't know, tailor-made yes. package, which you thought it was not useful for anyone apart you, but then indeed there are 20, 50, or hundreds of users that are, say, scattered throughout the world, and uh, they land on your page, and they start using it, and, uh, and they're happy about it. Uh, you, Francesco, cited, mentioned the Journal of Statistical Software. I was introduced to our by the early weekend tidy data in Journal of Statistical Software. So it, it, I know the format, I appreciate it also. And you mentioned teaching, but you also probably, or like to do research side by side, right? Or have to do, no, so, so. or want to do. Can you tell us about a recent project which where you were involved in, for example, um, dealing with longitudinal data, which is basically your, one of your expertise fields? Yes. Um, uh, okay. Uh, I, one of my main research topics is uh, that of latent variable models uh, with application to the analysis of uh, complex data structures. Uh, among uh, the complex data structures that I deal with, uh, there is that uh, of longitudinal data, 
sometimes even in combination with other characteristics. Uh, uh, for instance, sometimes uh, I analyzed or I proposed model to analyze the uh, longitudinal social network data. Uh, this is one of my most recent research uh, interests uh, in which, for instance, I uh, observe the evolution of uh, uh, a social network uh, across time. And so I have a sort of a sequence of uh, snapshots. Uh, each snapshot is uh, itself a social network referred to a different uh, period of time. And uh, uh, underlying my, my studies about uh, uh, longitudinal data frequently, uh, there is uh, a hidden Markov structure. So hidden Markov is a, I, I like a lot hidden Markov models and is one, one of my favorite uh, uh, topics of research. And even in this case of uh, social network data with a longitudinal structure, uh, even now I'm, I'm trying to apply uh, hidden Markov models. Okay, just to say something more, um, in this case, uh, uh, in practice, the main uh, um, uh, target is to uh, cluster individuals uh, in uh, certain classes, which are called blocks. Individuals in the same block uh, have uh, the same uh, social behavior, for instance, the same tendency to connect uh, uh, to other people. And uh, the main uh, point here is that I can model the evolution of individuals in terms of this behavior. And uh, to do this, uh, I allow individuals to move between the blocks uh, across time, okay? So this is the uh, main point in the hidden Markov uh, models. Uh, and so this, uh, this approach, this hidden Markov model, I think is very nice uh, and uh, is uh, even rather recent in, in longitudinal data analysis in the sense that uh, uh, the traditional research in longitudinal data is based in, uh, on other approaches. Uh, as for instance, uh, it is based on random effects models, uh, based on, uh, for instance, multivariate normal distribution. So this hidden Markov approach has uh, uh, some advantages. Uh, obviously, there are also some disadvantages. Uh, but the main ad advantages are uh, for instance, in the interpretation of the results, uh, because you can spot uh, uh, different uh, hidden classes or hidden clusters of individuals having uh, very similar behavior or the same behavior. And uh, you can uh, uh, really see the, the, how individuals move uh, across time between uh, these classes. And uh, I really love uh, this, uh, this topic. And uh, about this topic, I wrote um, a book in 2013, uh, 13 was edited. And uh, this book uh, um, also uses some, uh, some code uh, that uh, we implemented, but uh, honestly, we are thinking about uh, a new version of this book about hidden Markov models for longitudinal data, which is uh, uh, mainly based on R. So the, the title could be the a usual title from a certain point of view, like uh, hidden Markov for longitudinal models in R or something like this. Because uh, uh, we have now a very good, I hope a very good package in, uh, in R for fitting these models. And uh, we can uh, focus in writing this book uh, on, uh, on uh, this package to make examples. And uh, this is the same package I will, uh, I will present during uh, Iran uh, 2020. Oh, cool. I don't know if you knew that, but also the, either Markov models have also a broad, uh, a broad variety of applications also for bioinformatics as well. So yeah. what, wherever there's a sequence and then you would like to have some kind of a segmentation of it based of, on features that you observe and you would like to observe this latent state, that's, uh, yeah. that's actually a very, a very 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 proficient field for, for applying these algorithms so I think your interaction with the bioinformatician could be very uh, very promising well, one, yes, one, yes. one of the characteristics of ERAM actually is taking bringing together you know this different uh, apparently different I mean different fields but in terms of methods and tools it's surprising how uh, how many are the things that we have in common, uh, even if, or, of course, um, uh, we do have 
different approaches, approaches of a biologist, of a statistician, or, or an engineer, of course. Yes, yes, yes. And well, my, my perspective is uh, maybe a, a bit different uh, from uh, other uses of uh, the macro models, uh, in the sense that uh, in uh, our typical data set, uh, we have a short sequence in time, uh, maybe, I don't know, at most 10 observations in time, uh, but repeated for many, many individuals, like even 1,000, 12,000, and so on. Uh, and so uh, the model is the same uh, as uh, basic assumptions, uh, but the type of application is uh, a bit different. In the sense, we have many short sequences of data. Okay, this is the main difference. And uh, this aspect has, uh, um, has some implications in terms of, for instance, of properties of estimators uh, from the statistical point of view. Okay, but uh, the, the main assumptions are the same and I really love this approach. Uh, and uh, even if I didn't use, uh, I cannot say I, I used uh, uh, really, uh, uh, for instance, applications in biology, I really would be interested in, uh, in uh, studying this type of applications. I've seen uh, via one of your mm, retweets, I just browsed through uh, your Twitter account. And by the way, it's F at F underscore Bartolucci. So <laughs> if everyone, if anyone wants to, yes, to, to follow him. But anyway, uh, I've seen a um, reference to no level of alcohol consumption improves health. It's not a work of yours, of course, but that's interesting. And I was thinking, do you think, which is, which is actually a, a notion, a very practical notion, uh, do you think that statistics should be a very practical metric or at least an attitude, uh, a general attitude providing practical metrics to judge real life problems and to what extent? What's, what's your opinion on this? Yes, um, I think that, uh, for instance, the topic of causal inference uh, uh, is um, uh, represents a great distinction, for instance, uh, between uh, uh, pure statistics uh, and, uh, I don't know, machine learning, okay? In the sense that, uh, for instance, when uh, uh, we formulate a model, uh, we pay attention a lot to the problem of having assumptions that have a causal interpretation, okay? And, and so, for instance, uh, um, but not only in statistics, but also maybe in, in econometrics or in economics, uh, the aspect of causality is now very important, okay? And so what, uh, by causal inference, uh, um, what uh, we, we try to do, we, we try to answer a question like if a factor is really, or might be really considered like a cause or another effect, okay? Um, and so this is a bit different from saying that, uh, for instance, two variables are simply correlated or they depend on each other some, somehow. Uh, so I have to say that, uh, for instance, this, uh, this aspect is very important uh, and there should be more stressed uh, in, uh, even in society, no? on the possibility of, uh, of using statistics, uh, not only maybe to make prediction or to describe a phenomenon, but to also to establish uh, causal relations between uh, two variables or an intervention variable and a possible effect and so on, okay? Do we have a book you can recommend for reading that? So especially for the, we, I would like to have some kind of layman explanations. And I found it probably, I, I ordered that and it's already say on my night table before so for, for, for some reading uh, sessions. Uh, I have the book of why by Julia Pearl, but uh, are there any yeah. recommendation that you could do on that? Uh, yeah, well, one uh, is a very popular book uh, that you mentioned. Uh, okay. Indeed, there are uh, uh, competing approaches in causal inference. So, one, uh, the one of Perl is one of the possible approaches. Uh, and uh, another very popular approach uh, is based uh, on so-called potential outcomes. Uh, and one of the most important uh, researchers, uh, scientists, I should say, is uh, uh, Donald Rubin from Harvard University. And, um, and there are even other competing approaches. 
Uh, and so I can suggest uh, for sure some book uh, uh, based on potential outcome, out outcomes. Obviously, uh, I have to say that there is a competition uh, in this field between uh, uh, different subjects. So there is a competition between uh, statisticians uh, and people working in econometrics, okay? Um, because uh, as usual, uh, a single field is not of a subject, uh, is between uh, several subjects. And um, uh, even in this case, there is uh, maybe a, a possible distinction between uh, two subjects. Uh, so in this case, uh, statistics and uh, econometrics. Uh, this distinction is that uh, statisticians were more used uh, to experimental data. So the old fashioned statistician uh, has a way of thinking, uh, which is more is closer to experiments, okay? And so in which, uh, indeed, uh, if you work with experimental data, you have not so many problems to understand if uh, uh, a factor uh, is causing uh, so some effect, okay? Because uh, you build an experiment uh, so that it is evident, no? That uh, uh, you have a causal relation. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, people working in economics and uh, in econometrics are more used to observational data in which you can just observe the reality without the possibility of really making an experiment. So in the recent years uh, there was a, a contamination between these fields uh, uh, so that uh, now even for statisticians it's very common to work uh, only with observational data and uh, then uh, you have to apply uh, techniques uh, that somehow uh, replicate, uh, uh, we say, quasi-experiment. Okay, so starting from the data, which are maybe uh, purely observ observational data, and apply, I don't know, for instance, weights uh, to each unit, uh, or uh, some difference in time, and so on, uh, you start to, you try to replicate an uh, experimental data set. So the characteristics of an experimental data set. Obviously, the experiment is the best you can do to understand a causal relation. No? For instance, if you find, think about the uh, effect of a drug no, on a patient suffering from a certain disease, the experiment is uh, the uh, gold standard. But now, even with uh, pure uh, observational data, you can do a lot, really. You can uh, uh, sometimes really establish uh, causal relationships as if you had uh, experimental data, you can go very close. Obviously, it depends uh, on the application and on the quality, quality of the data, okay? Uh, that's all. <laughs> there are some colleagues of mine that are working actively on propensity score for, for, as a research yeah. topic, so I think this connects perfectly to this, so. Yes, yeah, for instance, propensity score is a, is a very popular uh, technique uh, uh, in uh, causal inference uh, is due to, to Rubin and uh, other colleagues. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, the main uh, uh, works uh, about propensity score have been published in, in uh, uh, Biometrica, which is for us uh, uh, one of the most important uh, journals, uh, statistical journal. Uh, but uh, now it's very popular even uh, in uh, medicine and, uh, and in economics. So it's, a, it's a standard already. Okay, um, when we have cross-sectional data and uh, you have a rich set of covariates, uh, typically people apply uh, propensity score. Okay, and so it's a very, very popular tool now. I don't know if I can, if I can just add one thing on the no level of alcohol consumption improves health, but it can improve the mood at the end of these crazy days. This is, I don't know, it's not scientifically <laughs> proven I'm, a, I'm an N equal one experiment, but uh, I, at least I can, I can, I can yeah. keep on uh, longitudinal data collection on myself and then we can <laughs> experiment with that. <laughs> so uh, if I, I have a motto in, in my head always, I think that you know, mathematics is about numbers and statistics is about things. That's why it's so interesting uh, about things and people. Um, but if it's true, uh, you mentioned machine learning uh, before. I would add, is machine learning about marketing? 
So there's a lot of buzz about machine learning, artificial intelligence, but of course, machine learning is something serious, maybe, I mean, much more serious than just, you know, a buzzword. Uh, so which is the right role and position for machine learning today, according to your vision and, and, and in, your, in your job? Uh, okay, uh, honestly, I have to say that I'm a pure statistician. Uh, so, uh, I, I don't know um, so in deep uh, machine learning. So, my impression, uh, uh, anyway, is that uh, um, frequently statistics and machine learning uh, are two subjects that uh, use uh, the same methods. In the end, uh, uh, it is very common to see that uh, people work in machine learning, for instance, uh, uh, use a finite mixture model, which is uh, typically a, a statistical model to recognize uh, and cluster or classify objects or individuals and so on. Uh, I think that uh, mm, the perspective uh, of the two subjects is a bit different. So maybe that uh, in the end they use uh, the same tools, uh, but uh, giving result to different aspects and uh, with a different level of study of the properties of the methods, okay? Uh, so just to summarize, uh, summarize, I think that uh, machine learning is very practical, I would say. So it's very useful in practice uh, and uh, now is, a, is, a, is very common, you know? many methods uh, are classified, maybe casted in to, maybe cast in, uh, in machine learning field. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, statistics maybe pay more attention, I don't know, to the properties of a method, to the theoretical properties of a method. Uh, and, though, and so I have to admit that sometimes uh, statistics is seen uh, as something more annoying, if I have to be honest, than machine learning. <laughs> Because uh, in machine learning, you pay more attention to practical aspects, uh, to, I don't know, prediction, uh, something very concrete. Uh, in statistics, you, you pay more attention, you know, to the properties of a method, uh, to the properties of estimators, and so on. Uh, and uh, to prove such properties, maybe uh, you need the strong assumptions uh, that sometimes are not uh, realistic, you know, are far from the reality. Um, and so uh, I think that now there is a strong competition between the two subjects uh, and the explanation why maybe uh, machine learning now is a bit more popular among uh, the community than statistics uh, is that uh, is uh, perceived as something more concrete, I think, more practical, more focused on uh, predictions and so on. On the other hand, I, I'm still a, a statistician in the sense that uh, my way of thinking is the typical statistician uh, who, that when uh, uh, propose a new method wants to be sure of the properties, uh, although sometimes uh, uh, we have to pro prove such properties uh, in a very strict context with very strong assumptions and so on. And uh, another important distinction is that of uh, causality that I mentioned before. I think that uh, this is a, a very important point. Statistics, uh, maybe uh, in applying a method uh, uh, tries to provide an explanation, okay? Um, and so it's more focused on causality and so on. I think, but I, I hope I'm not wrong, that machine learning is more focused on predictions or practical aspects, okay? Uh, and this is one of the distinction between the two subjects. <laughs> Thank you. We are, yeah, we, we, we are kind of ready to ask you if you want to give us an, a, a short aperitivo on what can come in your keynote. You said already, you mentioned already probably yeah, uh, it, but, uh, if you want to add something more to keep our community excited about your upcoming speech. Uh, yeah, yes. Um, my, the, the package, uh, first of all, uh, has been implemented with other colleagues. Uh, we started uh, this work uh, a few years ago, and uh, now uh, the, the current version of the package uh, is in practice a, a set of functions that uh, may be applied to analyze longitudinal data uh, with this Markov approach. And uh, 
One uh, key point is that uh, it may be used uh, with uh, response variables of different uh, natures. So we can deal with uh, continuous uh, responses, uh, categorical responses, uh, and even with uh, multivariate longitudinal data. So when we have uh, more response variables observed at each occasion. Uh, another important point is that uh, in these models, uh, you can also include uh, uh, individual covariates uh, that may be also time varying. And uh, uh, since the model is uh, composed by different submodels, uh, so for instance, you have a, a mainly a measurement model and a structural model, you can uh, include the covariates in different ways. And uh, you can include the covariates uh, in one or the other component of the model or even in both, but uh, this, uh, this extension uh, is, uh, is more difficult. And um, one of the main uh, aspects uh, uh, that may be interest, of interest, uh, in particular, for instance, for people uh, uh, working in machine learning, machine learning, sorry, is the uh, possibility of clustering individuals uh, in a dynamic way, okay? So in practice, we build uh, a set of uh, so-called latent states, uh, which are, nothing else than clusters of units so in a typical application of individuals and uh, we can understand how individuals move between uh, for instance different classes uh, in two consecutive occasions and uh, the way in which may, may they move depends on uh, a transition matrix uh, which is in practice the main parameters in these models and the transition matrix has elements corresponding to the probabilities of moving from one latent state to, to the other. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Make hey, sure you check out then LM Est, right? Is it capital L, capital yes. M Est? Yeah, so, okay, I'll leave it up to you, Rick, for wrapping up. Yes, thank you very much, Francesco. It's been a pleasure uh, this chat with you. And we look forward to, to hear you at the keynote, of course, next June. And thank you for, for, for being here with us. Thank you for your time and okay. your kindness. For the invitation. So bye-bye, everyone. Ciao. See you. Bye. Ciao.